Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath and welcome to Sabbath School. Our lesson this week is Lesson 5 from our quarterly on how to interpret scripture. But before we get started, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day and for the privilege of studying your holy word. And although we cannot be together physically, we are together in mind and heart in Jesus our Savior. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might have wisdom and understanding as we proceed in our lesson. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned, we are on Lesson 5, which is titled, By Scripture Alone or Sola Scriptura. It has been mentioned in previous lessons that the Protestant claim of sola scriptura, or scripture alone, elevated scripture to the sole standard and decisive source of theology and doctrine. This is the position that we as Seventh-day Adventists hold. In this lesson, we will look at sola scriptura in greater detail. To begin, let's look at our memory verse, on the Sabbath's lesson, it's Hebrews 4.12, and I will be reading from the New King James Version. As a matter of fact, uh, all of the text that I give will be from the New King James Version. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and powerful and sharpen, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The double-edged sword has two sides, so that it can cut in two different directions. A double-edged sword can separate truth from lies by sharply cutting to the quick. It can change the directions of a person's life if they apply God's word to their life. When the book of Hebrews was written, the church faced the possibility of persecution. So the author was warning them about the temptation to deny their faith so that they might live a more comfortable life. But that same word is here for us today. It is trouble out there, but it's here for us today. It is infallible, unchanging, convicting, and living and active. And the scriptures tell us that the sword of the Spirit is what? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It is part of our um, armor of God to protect us so that we are able to fight and be armed against the adversary. The Word of God also has two edges to it. There's the New Testament and there's the Old Testament. They both are important because they both proclaim of Jesus. Sunday's lesson is titled, Scripture as the Ruling Norm. As Bible-believing Christians, we acknowledge that, that the biblical principle of sola scriptura is the ruling norm for our theology and ultimate authority of our life and doctrine. As was pointed out by Dr. Bill Ward in last week's lessons, all other sources such as religious experiences, human reason, tradition, are all subservient to the Bible. Let's look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself 
and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf one against the other. The key words here, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Traditions are part of all cultures, and as I mentioned, not all traditions are bad, as long as they do not go against the teachings of the Bible. Extra biblical sources such as concordances, history, lexicon, dictionaries, or other books and commentaries can help us to better understand the biblical text and give us insight. However, all viewpoints must be evaluated carefully from the standpoint of Scripture. We should not go against beyond what is written in the Scriptures. Regarding the primacy for the Scriptures, I want to look at Acts 17, verses 10 and 11. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. There were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the words with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So even in the early church, Christians were admonished to search the scriptures daily for truth. Churches have developed traditions over the years, and not all of them are bad but they should always be measured against the truth of the scriptures. In the early 4th century AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine made a big political move on his part to join his subjects together under him. He abolished the persecution of Christians and indeed called himself a Christian and decided that his people should be united under Christianity. However, he did allow the non-Christians, or what we would call pagans, of his realm to retain many of their pagan practices. So Christianity adopted many pagan rituals and iconographies, holidays, and other practices. Many of these practices remain in some Christian churches today. They are not biblical, but they have become so embedded and tradition that has become truth to them. But there are many faithful Christians in these churches. Jesus addressed the priests and Pharisees about transgressing the commandments of God because of their traditions. In Mark 15, chapter 15, verses 9 through 7, Jesus said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And they worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It was Bible truth that spearheaded the Reformation, and sola scriptura was the battle cry. When the light of scripture brought Martin Luther to the truth that the just shall live by faith, he said, out to correct the evil practices and traditions of the established church. The church was teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Other reformers before him paid the ultimate price by standing on the word of God alone. Another thing we are warned about in scripture is about putting our feelings or our own ideas above scripture. There is a common saying, just follow your heart. And many people live by this, but sometimes people have followed their hearts and lived to regret it. What does the Bible say about that? Let's look at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. God says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So sometimes we can't even trust our own feelings about things. And feelings can be very strong in us. It is always important, if you are in a valley of indecision, to ask God, what is his will for your life? Ask him, pray, and the Holy Spirit will guide you. We have to ask ourselves if our plans are lining up with God's plans for us. 
Monday's lesson is about the unity of Scripture. We will look at some scriptures that show why the unity of the Bible is important to our beliefs. First, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of scripture is God-breathed. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. God is telling us to stay faithful and to stand on his word. Only on the basis of its internal unity, a unity that is derived from its divine inspiration, can scripture function as its own interpreter. If there was no unity of scripture, we could not find harmony in doctrine. We would not be able to distinguish error from truth or repudiate heresy. There would be no basis to apply disciplinary measure or to correct deviations from the truth. In other words, the scripture would lose its power. There is no discord between the Old and the New Testament. The New Testament builds upon the Old Testament. It does not contain a new gospel or a new religion. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. The Old Testament is not to be ignored. Indeed, Jesus and the Apostles quoted from the Old Testament 855 times. Paul quotes 105 verses from the Old Testament from 19 different books. Tuesday is about the clarity of Scripture. Many people feel that the Bible is difficult to understand, and that's understandable if you read bits and pieces here and there. And there are symbols and figurative language that also can be difficult to grasp. But here's the thing. You have to keep reading and reading. And you pray. You prayerfully study the scriptures. If you will keep reading, you will come to understand who Jesus is, his life, and why he came to save us. You will understand his plan of salvation for us, and you will also understand how much he loves us. Let's look at what Jesus said about understanding. Matthew 21, 42 says that Jesus said to them, Have you never read in scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Matthew 12, verse 3. But he said to them, Have you now read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? Matthew 12, verse 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? And one more here. Matthew 22, verses 31 and 32. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead but of the living. So these are just a few examples of Jesus asking, have you not read? And here again, he's talking about the Old Testament. So just keep reading and reading and let scriptures explain themselves. The basic teachings of the Bible can be understood by believers. If we pray for understanding and wisdom, the Holy Spirit will teach us. Other sources that we may go to for understanding the Bible must also be in accord with God's words. 
A good Bible translation should be used, one that is faithful to the original Hebrew and Greek, and not a paraphrase, because a paraphrase is, um, is someone else's phrasing of their own ideas or their own beliefs or their own interpretations, and they may not match up to the original language of the scriptures. The texts that I have quoted, as I said, have come from the New King James Version. I like that because it is faithful to the original Hebrew and Greek of the scriptures. And besides that, it's, it's, the English is understandable. It's put in our more modern language. A translation in a more modern language can sometimes be more understandable for some. I remember as a child at hearing the, um, when it was talking about the disciples trying to keep the children away from Jesus. And Jesus would say, suffer the little children to come unto me. And the word suffer confused me. I didn't. I knew what suffer meant in our present day language, but I didn't know why Jesus was using that language. Well, now I know that he was really saying, allow or let the little children come to him. On Wednesday, we talk about scripture interpreting scripture. Because of the underlying unity of the scriptures, the Bible can function as its own interpreter. Let's see how Jesus refers back to the scriptures to refer who he is. Two of Jesus' followers are on the road to Emmaus, but they don't recognize him. Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scripture the things concerning himself. And down to verse 44, verses 44 and 45. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Letting scripture interpret scripture leads to a better understanding of its own meaning. And we have to be careful to consider the context of each passage. What comes before and what comes after. If we want to uh, study a given subject in the Bible, then we go to all the scriptures that talk about that certain topic so they can be compared, the scriptures be compared with each other. In Romans 14, 5, Paul says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. So the Old Testament was written for our learning also. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scripture, might have hope. The Bible was written for us. My 13-year-old grandson likes to watch a program called God Friended Me. And it's about a young atheist man who has a podcast. And he likes to talk about atheism and his non-belief in God. Well, one day on his cell phone, he got a friend request from God. Now, he doesn't really think it's from God. He thinks somebody else is behind it. But as the show progresses and he sees more and more miracles coming about, I think he is starting to question his uh, atheism. But I accidentally called it one day, God texted me, and got a laugh from that. They said, that's not what it's called, it's called God friended me. Well, you know, God has been sent us a big text message, and it's in his word. We even. Um, we even call the verses text sometimes. And this big text message is important for our eternal salvation, and we should read it. Jesus taught in parables, meant to teach an important lesson or a spiritual truth. But if you read them just the first time, it might be difficult to understand. But you continue reading, and you see that Jesus explains the meaning of those par parables. So you have to read on. The symbols and figures of Old Testament visions and prophecies are very difficult to understand. But when you keep reading, 
and comparing scripture, it will explain itself and give more understanding, but you have to keep reading. Thursday, Thursday's lesson is about Solar Scriptura and Ellen G. White. Since we Seventh-day Adventists believe in Sola Scriptura, we sometimes are confronted with the question of Ellen G. White and her relationship and her writings to the Scripture. We do believe that Ellen G. White was inspired by God and served as his messenger to his remnant people, but her writings are not in addition to Scripture and indeed are subject to Scripture. In her writings, she clearly shows that for her, the Bible was foundation and central in all her thought and theology. In fact, she repeatedly affirmed that the Bible was the highest authority, an ultimate norm and standard for all doctrine. Her writings are never to be used as a shortcut and never to replace serious Bible study. I have some quotes here that I would like to read. First of all, from Seventh-day Adventist Believe, page 227. It states that Seventh-day Adventists believe that the writings of Ellen White are not a substitute for Scripture. They cannot be placed on the same level. The Holy Scripture stand alone, the unique standard by which her and all other writings must be judged, and to which they must be subject. Quoting Ellen White herself, she says, All human teaching should be subordinate to the oracles of God. He, meaning Christ, pointed to the scriptures as of unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God as the end of all controversy and the foundation of all faith. Leave the impression upon the mind that the Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith, and that the sayings and doings of men are not to be a criterion for our doctrines or actions. The Bible and the Bible alone is our creed and sole bond of union. All who bow to this, his holy word will be in harmony. Our own views and ideas must not control our efforts. Again, our own views and ideas must not control our efforts. Man is fallible, but God's word is infallible. Scriptures as a safeguard she quotes to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And this is from Isaiah 8.20. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive powers of spirits of darkness. The last grand illusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. And lastly, only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and those who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. By the Bible testimonies, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. To all the testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they, in such a crisis, cling to the Bible and the Bible only? And these are just a few of her quotes that she has said regarding the Bible and the Bible only as the sole authority for our doctrine. 
We are indeed living in troublesome times. People are calling in to question who they could trust. So now is the time for us to take up the sword of the Spirit, complete our full armor of God, so that we are ready to stand against the adversary. It is our safety, it's our salvation. We can put our trust in the Lord. Nobody loves us more than he does. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for the love and the care that you have for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who lives to intercede for us. Lord, we pray that this scourge of the coronavirus will soon pass. We pray that you will be with everyone on the front line in this fight, that you will be with our families and the schools and the teachers and the students. Lord, in the coming weeks, may we draw even closer to you. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.